and we've been very lucky with the weather while we're here. So um, I'll just quickly race through uh, the, the, the broad content. I think we need to remind ourselves why we're interested in M health for behaviour change. And then is there indeed a quality problem or a suspicion of a quality problem? And also think about what does quality mean in the context of M health and in general? And what range of methods have we got are available for, for improving quality? And of course, evaluation is a key core of those methods. Um, so I've got a couple of case studies, um, examples of evaluation studies that we've done. And I hope I'll mention some other studies that other, other people have done, particularly systematic reviews, um, before coming to some conclusions. So um, reminding ourselves, why are we interested in, in, in M health and behaviour change? What's the connection? Well, first of all, as we've just heard and heard yesterday, face-to-face -face contact with people to change their behaviour is great, can be very effective, but doesn't really scale to the size of the, for example, obesity epidemic. Um, whereas smartphone hardware is now being used by you know, different surveys, come up with different results, about three quarters of people with mobile phones have smartphones and uh, increasingly 100% of the population, in fact 110% of the population has smartphones because some uh, have phones because some people have more than one. So there's a lot of smartphones out there um, uh, and not just owned by rich people, uh, it's something which people m try and afford. Um, uh, they're cheap, they're convenient, they're fashionable. There's a range of inbuilt sensors and of course wearables increasingly, smart watches, bands, trackers, etc. That, that, that link. Uh, so we can make lots of different measurements from, from, from these devices. And we can communicate with people through multiple channels. We can give people choice over what channel um, we, we send them reminders or, or, or messages. And the software um, can be amazingly complex, even though it's just running on a little tiny device. So we can produce unobtrusive alerts, to record data, to take action. We can incorporate behaviour change techniques. And there's a lovely poster by Emma Morris Morrissey here looking at the, the kinds of BCTs present in um, apps for drug adherence. And 96% of drug adherence apps did show evidence of at least one of those BCTs with a median of two. So that's great. People are maybe not consciously but unconsciously putting these BCTs into apps. The other great thing about um, smartphones and M Health is that we can tailor, and we know that tailoring makes behaviour change more effective. Um, the corrected D, that's the, um, the, the difference in means divided by the standard deviation of 0.16, that's about a sixth of a standard deviation difference due to tailoring. This is a, a, a meta regression from uh, Lustria in Journal Health Communication 2013. So that's out of 21 studies on behaviour change websites as opposed to M Health. But Probably tailoring is a generic feature um, which should transfer across media. So tailoring is important and we can do it with uh, mobile health. So why digital channels? Um, uh, and uh, one of the persuasive um, uh, sources of evidence comes from the Cabinet Office report. And they were looking at the cost of encounters. Now, this isn't about behaviour change. This is just encounters in general, paying your council tax, that kind of thing. And you can see there, a face-to-face -face encounter is expensive, nearly £9. A letter is nearly as expensive, £5. Telephone call, about half of that. Digital is 1 60th the cost of face-to-face. -face. So this is why... Governments are interested in digital and moving um, encounters and uh, behaviour change to the digital channel. Huge economists um, there if, if, if it works. But while we're on economics, it does appear as though we've got some problems. It's a bit of a broken market at the moment. If you look at, for example, the price of behaviour change apps, in this case um, for smoking cessation, this is from Abram's study 2013, 47 smoking cessation apps, and they looked at the quality of the evidence incorporated in the app, um, and I've grafted against the price of those 47 apps, and you can see there is zero correlation here. There are apps that cost $40. $40. The scale incidentally goes from zero to 64, so that's uh, right over by the other side of the room, and none of the apps went more than halfway on their scale of good evidence. Um, the, 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 the gold standard for good evidence was the US Preventive Service Task Force guidelines, which are very evidence-based. And you can see there's a wide scatter of evidence scores, the predominant ones being you know, right at this end, almost no evidence at all. And some of the pricier ones, here's one about $8, one at $40, almost no evidence. So that's what the economist would call a broken market. Um, 
There are some other concerns about apps around privacy, um, and I had a couple of medical students look at um, apps, um, popular apps on, um, I think this was the Android store, um, and they request a whole variety of permissions, even a very simple app that in this case is just uh, about measuring your heart rate. We'll ask a whole range of uh, permissions, reading your phone ID, looking at files, viewing your connections, viewing your, um, uh, your contacts list, uh, your browsing history, recent phone calls, etc. It's amazing how many. Um, but looking at 80 apps, there was a median of four clear privacy breaches for health and lifestyle apps, only one breach for so-called medical apps. So statistically fewer for medical apps, but still one is not good. Um, and you could say, well, of course, we know that when we download the app, we read the terms and conditions, don't we? Well, for that heart rate app, it was only 1,200 words, but many are much longer, even as long as a Shakespearean play. Um, unfortunately, it's not as you like it, it's as they like it. That's the business model for free apps. They get your data. So um, there are some worries about um, the quality of, of M Health apps in particular. Uh, I was just looking at this recent, very recent systematic review on digital health in cardiovascular disease. Some of those are very well apps, some text messages, websites, etc. A whole range of different de digital health interventions. And you can see that there's some pretty good news here that in terms of CD CBD outcomes, that that's you know, strokes, heart attacks, etc., there appeared to be a, a, a really dramatic, is that a 39% reduction in risk, uh, obviously over varying time frames, different studies. Um, weight, there was a reduction of 1.3 kilograms um, in weight for those that focused on that. But look here, I squared, that's a measure of the heterogeneity. Um, uh, in the systematic in the systematic review, I squared is is very very high heterogeneity. So that means that some of these um, uh, studies showed a big result, others didn't show any result at all. Um, body mass index, a rather small, very modest, in fact, reduction in in, in body mass index, 0.17. Um, again, a lot of heterogeneity here, 97 um, percent. No change at all in blood pressure in those that targeted blood pressure. Um, so uh, in the, the average was 1.2 millimeter drop, but that was uh, lost in, in, in the noise. Again, a lot of heterogeneity. Uh, there was a reduction in the framium risk score, but again, it's only minus 1% um, and a lot of heterogeneity. So the question is, you know, what is actually happening here? Um, they looked at the heterogeneity. It wasn't explained by the different baseline risk, the study population, primary, secondary prevention, nor the modality of digital healthcare, so whether it was an app, text messaging, or, or, or whatever. So it does seem as though people are doing studies on digital healthcare um, uh, interventions um, with a hugely, huge range of, of, of results. And that sounds like a quality control problem to me. Now, I'm not a quality expert, but I did look up the ISO definition of quality, and they talk about the totality of features and characteristics of the product that bear on its ability to satisfy stated or implied needs. Um, so, in other words, quality is about fitness for purpose. A good quality product will comply with client requirements. The trouble is that sometimes these requirements aren't very well formulated. Incidentally, that 30-page ISO document costs you £96 to download, so I'm not sure that that complies with client requirements itself, but uh, that's another story, perhaps. So that's, that's, that's the definition of, of quality. And there's a whole load of methods that um, are being used currently to try and monitor and improve quality of, of, of M Health uh, products. From uh, the wisdom of the crowd, we'll see about that in a moment, um, Users applying explicit quality criteria, that's something which we are beginning to develop at the College of Physicians. Um, the classic peer-reviewed article, which it could be rigorous, not always, um, but it's very slow, and again, it probably doesn't scale. Um, physician peer review would be another um, model, and there is something called iMedical Apps, but again, I'm not sure that it really scales. Uh, but it, 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 if, if the app that you're interested in has been reviewed by them, then it's probably quite a useful source. What about asking developers to self-certify? Well, yes, in principle, that's a good idea, but do the developers really understand what quality uh, is and comply with that? Um, and the checklists that have been published in other, pla uh, in other places for other, other, other purposes don't really fit um, the, the app. So, for example, the HON code, Health on the Net code, is for websites rather than apps. 
Developer support probably needed, um, and I was part of a team that produced the British Standard Institution PAS 277, which was published about a month ago, and that's very much intended to be supportive of developers. Uh, the problem is that with apps uh, and some of these other uh, technologies, there's very low barriers to market entry. Anybody can develop an app. Um, you know, kids at school got a friend with asthma, they might hit the net and find out some stuff and put it together into an app and put it on the app store. Uh, very easy for them to do that, and that's one of the great advantages of this um, uh, area. But on the other hand, those kids are probably not going to look up the British Standard Institution Publicly Accessible Standard 277. Um, <laughs> What about CE marking and regulation? Some people are saying, well, what we should be doing is regulating. I personally am not a big fan of regulation. Um, and we'll see in a moment that uh, some of the regulators don't seem to be a big fan of regulation either. Um, it's slow, it's expensive, apps don't fit the kind of national model of regulation. Um, so um, regulation of medical apps by the FDA particularly. Um, now, if an app is classed as a medical device, then it, it must demonstrate efficacy. But so far, only 100 apps were classed as medical devices, and they decided to exercise enforcement discretion on most of those. So the FDA is really kind of standing back. It's been forced to stand back, actually, by the industry. There have been letters to Congress saying uh, FDA mustn't meddle in this extreme, extremely important uh, area for the economy. Um, funnily enough, the, the Federal Communication Commission, a, a, a parallel agency in the States, has banned some apps and misleading claims. So I don't think we can rely on regulation. And anyway, many apps for behaviour change with members of the public wouldn't fall under this definition of medical devices. So we need to think about new ways of enhancing quality, uh, ways that will somehow empower patient choice and professional choice, um, will use criteria that make sense to them and also to, to health systems and industry, that will be affordable and scale, scalable. We know there are many, many thousands of apps out there, which will be proportional to clinical risk. Um, there's something called the Good Regulation Task Force in the UK, which came up with some principles for regulation. and says, well, it, you've got to be proportional. It's got to be targeted. Don't try and regulate across the board. Focus on areas of risk. Yes, we need to respect and promote useful innovation. Innovation by itself isn't necessarily a good thing. Uh, innovation is only good if it does actually lead to improvement. And a vigorous app marketplace. And what we really need is some kind of Darwinian process with survival of the fittest apps. Um, and it's got to fit with the rapidly evolving apps market and be resistant to manipulation and be auditable. We'll see an example of that in a moment. Um, so essentially... What that checklist of, of criteria suggests is that we need to think differently. We don't, there's no place for paternalism, um, the idea that regulation will eliminate harmful apps after release. That's incredibly wasteful and not a sensible way forward. And we don't think that the health system should control apps either. Um, but currently, the app developers are very much in control, and what we feel uh, is that Aristotle's civil society should be in control, that we, the people, should uh, try and help uh, the, the, the market uh, achieve the, 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 the balance of benefits and risks and, and, and the survival of the fittest. Um, so um, I, I mentioned that uh, one of the problems with um, going to the market uh, for... Um, for quality, uh, doesn't necessarily, you know, it's a great idea that the wisdom of the crowd will, will, will uh, bring the best apps up to the top. But actually, again, looking at this Abrams data, uh, I also looked at the, um, the ranking in the app store, which, as you know, is closely correlated with the, the reviews and the star ratings. And it turns out that, again, there isn't really any correlation between the display ranking um, and the quality of the, of the apps. If anything, there appears to be a slight negative correlation. So the, the higher quality apps seem to be ranked lower um, in, the, um, uh, in the, uh, the app stores um, rather than the, the, the ones here, which really didn't seem to have much evidence behind them at all. And you, know, you can speculate about a number of reasons for that. Maybe if you're nice or uh, someone who really knows the field, you don't bother with a clever name for your app, you don't bother with a viral marketing campaign, you just put it up there on the app store and as a result nobody really notices it. Whereas if you don't have that 
tradition of evidence, then you get in the marketing people and a graphic designer, some really nice graphics, uh, 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 and so on. So that may be the reason. Or alternatively, it may be, um, again, this is another uh, example of a fair market, it may be that we've actually got manipulation here by the industry of uh, rankings and ratings. And we know that, for example, uh, it's easy to buy fake Twitter accounts. There are click factories uh, in various places with, with, with uh, um, low wages, um, mainly in the Far East. So it's actually very cheap to purchase 1,000 or 10,000 or more um, uh, star ratings for, for, for an app if you want to. So it may be that that's what we're seeing here. So uh, the, the, the wisdom of the crowd is being perverted by commercial uh, pressures. So if we're trying to promote quality of the marketplace and, and quality is, is, is fitness for purpose, uh, then we've got a problem because the, the users and the purposes for apps and, and, and other mHealth tools vary. So a simple kind of good, bad quality market is never going to be sufficient. And um, if you look at food labels, for example, you see that. Um, maybe 20, 30 years ago, uh, there was something called the good housekeeping quality mark. Whereas now, food is labelled with the ingredients, the calories, whether there are any allergens, um, whether it's suitable for vegetarians, the origin, which country the meat has come from, etc. So there's actually a very multi-axial label uh, now because different people want different things from their food. So what we need is some kind of checklist of optional criteria to empower people to choose apps of good quality and promote them. Um, and ideally what you should be able to do is to select the criteria you want and rate according to the complexity of the app and the contextual risk. And um, Tom Lewis and, and myself have, have written a paper on that in Jimmo. And then the apps need to be labelled to make that quality explicit. And that should then add this new Darwinian selection pressure to the app's marketplace, we hope. Um, so what quality criteria could we use? Well, um, I'm afraid we went back, well back, before smartphones, before apps, almost before, yes, certainly before the personal computer, to Don Abedian 1966. Don Abedian wrote about the quality of healthcare systems, and he talked about the structure, the processes, and the outcomes. Um, so that's a paper in Millbank Quarterly, 1966. So what's the structure? What would that be here? Well, it's things like the app development team, the evidence base they relied on, whether an appropriate behavior change technique was used, etc. Those would be structural issues, whether there are precautions against um, uh, un uh, illicit use of your data, pr privacy, uh, and so on. The processes, that, the equivalent of that would be the functions of the app. Is it usable? Is any advice it gives or output it gives, risk calculation, accurate? And then the outcomes are the impact of the app on a whole range of things. We'll talk in a moment about those, but things like user knowledge, self-efficacy, user behaviours, maybe resource utilisation in the healthcare system. So that's the broad framework. Just going into a little bit more detail, um, there really need to be uh, appropriate components, as well as an appropriate sponsor and, and, and the skills of the developer. You know, an app that comes from a pharmaceutical company is probably not going to be completely unbiased if, it, if it's about uh, uh, competing medications for a given disease. They may have some slant on that. Um, there's got to be appropriate components, and I won't go through all of those. Um, accurate knowledge from a reliable source, like NICE and uh, uh, similar organisations. And how do you decide, how do you evaluate that? Well, it's about independent expert review of the app and, and the, the source code of the app, if you can get hold of it, and maybe talking to the app developers and checking what um, evidence went into it, a little bit like Abrams did. The process is, does the app work well, is the key question here. And suggested measures are things like uh, download rates, which might be a surrogate for user recognition, usage rates, Obviously, immediately after download, but ideally three months, maybe even three years afterwards. The time taken to enter data, receive report, is it, is it clunky, is it easy to use? Uh, acceptability, usability, um, accuracy, uh, and I'll, I've got a case study on that, um, and then appropriateness of any advice given. And that's about lab testing and surveys. Um, those are the methods you'd use for that. And then the final one would be uh, on the structure, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Let's just look at the, the case study. So this was looking at cardiovascular um, risk calculation apps. And again, this was with a couple of medical students from Leeds. And what we did is we searched for um, all of the apps. This was actually on the Apple platform. 
both free and paid, and they were apps that the public might use in the UK to assess their personal risk of heart attacks and stroke. And then we developed 15 scenarios, which varied in risk from very low risk, 1%, up to 98%. This is 10-year risk. Um, and we deliberately set up those scenarios so that they actually tested a range of input data values. So, for example, whether you were a cigarette smoker or not, whether you had a family history or not, um, a range of cholesterol, etc. Um, and then we uh, assessed the risk figure given by the app, the format of the risk, and the advice given. Um, and we compared it against the, uh, the correct <coughs> advice or correct risk, um, which is when the app said it was above 20%, that would be an error if, if the gold standard um, was below 20% or vice versa. That was based on nice guidance. Um, so here, I think, are the results. We only found 21 apps, but of those, only 19 gave figures. About half of those were paid. All of the 19 that gave figures communicated risk using per percentages. Now, that's a bad start because we know that members of the public, and actually doctors as well, find it difficult to deal with percentages. It's much easier if you express it in times n out of a 1,000. Um, uh, check Gigerenza's advice uh, on that. Um, and that's based on empirical studies. One app said see your GP every time it gave, you know, whatever the probability uh, that it calculated, even if you had a 1% risk, it said go see your GP. Um, <laughs> none of the rest gave any advice about what you should do with this figure. Um, and some of the apps refused to accept key data. For example, if you were older than 74, if you had diabetes, uh, they just ignored that. So not surprisingly, um, they gave, some of them gave misleading results. This is about the misclassification rate with the 20% threshold. And the misclassification rate varied from 7%, so that's 93% correct classification, which is pretty good for some apps, um, up to 33%. So that's two-thirds of the time um, it was correct and only one-third uh, one it was wrong. And you'll see that, um, well, I won't go into the details of this, the error rate for the free apps was significantly less than for the paid apps, which was interesting. Again, it suggests that we've got a broken market. Um, and the median rate for the free was 13%, as opposed to 27% error rate for the, 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 the paid apps. You can see the, the figures, and there are the details of the apps that we looked at. So... Um, I think it's, it's a useful um, exercise to go through assessing the accuracy of apps. It obviously only applies to apps that give advice or calculate a risk or, or recommend a drug dosage, that kind of thing. You do need a gold standard if you're going to do that. Um, um, and in this case, in our case, it was Q, something called QRIS2. You also need, uh, ideally, a representative case series or some simulated cases that are somehow plausible and, and, and have been deliberately designed to, to sample across a wide range of risk. In our study, the medical students entered the data into the apps, and that's obviously not great. What we should have is actual users entering the data um, or putting in their own data, ideally. And another question when you're doing an accuracy study is how accurate is accurate enough? Well, that depends really on the context, on the risk, etc. Um, if it's an app for calculating radiotherapy doses for use by a clinician, then probably it needs to be pretty, pretty accurate. And, of course, the biggest challenge is that even if an app is accurate, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will be used or that it will encourage users to take the correct actions. So just because you've done an accuracy study, uh, that doesn't kind of let you off the hook of doing an impact study. But there's something you can do before an impact study, um, which is called an intervention modelling experiment. And this kind of links back to the MRC framework for complex interventions. There's the reference. Uh, the idea is that what you want to do is to optimise your intervention before you submit it to a randomised trial. Because trials are ex can be expensive, they can be time-consuming, they require ethical approval, etc. It, it makes good sense to optimise your app before you, before you do a study on it. So you can measure a whole range of things in intervention and modelling experiments, IMEs, acceptability, usability, the accuracy of the data that's input and the accuracy of the output. But more importantly, whether users correctly interpret the output and and st at least say that they're likely to act on it, um, whether it maybe improves their self-efficacy um, or their uh, emotional response to the output, uh, and, and maybe also their impressions and suggested improvements. So here's an example. Um, this, is, this is actually not M Health. This was um, uh, about e-prescribing systems for junior doctors in hospital. 
Uh, and the background here is that most of these e-prescribing systems have alerts coming up and they're very annoying and people turn off the whole system because it's just too annoying having these stacked up alerts. So we did a study um, in 24 junior doctors looking at prescribing scenarios. We asked them to prescribe then we gave them advice either in an interruptive alert that flicked up on the front of the screen or on a um, uh, the same alert text um, which came up on the e-prescribing interface which didn't, shouldn't have interrupted them. Um, and here's an example of an interruptive alert in a modal dialog box. Um, and here's the non-interruptive version. It's the same text that appeared actually on the e-prescribing system, so it shouldn't interrupt them. And interestingly, that wasn't as effective as the interruptive alert, but it was still quite effective. Um, it was a lot more acceptable. However, those intervention modelling experiments, while they're useful in optimising your intervention uh, before the trial, you really need to go on to look at the bottom line and outcomes. And what you're looking at is things like the impact of a, of a health promotion app on user knowledge and attitudes. And I, I, Emma Carr's got a nice study looking at um, breast cancer awareness. Um, uh, there's a poster on that. Um, Self-efficacy would be another metric you could look at. Short-term, long-term behaviour change. Individual health-related outcomes, of course, and ultimately population health. And here, the study method really is randomised controlled trials. So far, rather few of these. We've heard of one or two here at the conference. Uh, one of the first I know of is actually from Leeds. I wasn't involved in it. Um, it was a study on a uh, weight loss app called My Meal Mate. Um, you can, of course, do some of these studies online. And I, I put this in as an example just to show that it's actually very quick and easy to do online studies. This was um, testing Fogg's persuasive technology theories, which were mentioned earlier today. Um, and we were interested in seeing whether we could use those to enhance uptake of the uh, people's sign-up rates for the NHS organ uh, donation register. Um, so we built two different versions of a website in this case, one of which was a kind of um, control website which lacked all the things that Fogg says would be persuasive. Um, and here's the intervention website which was the persuasive one which has got eight different features which Fogg says should make things make a difference, um, increase the, the sign-up rate. But in fact um, there was no difference when we randomised 900 students. But really the, 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 the interesting uh, lesson from this is that we intended, we did a sample size calculation that we needed 840 students. So we opened recruitment um, and within five days we'd got 900 students. So we were rather late in closing the, 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 the uh, recruitment process. Um, so uh, online trials can be a very effective, uh, quick way of, of, of testing a hypothesis here. And this was actually an example of an evaluation study which was negative, which disproved the theory in this, in this case. Some of the more technically minded people here might say, well, why should we bother with doing this very expensive, complex um, on, uh, field study? Can't we just predict the results? We know we've done something good. We know it's accurate. Surely it's going to work. Well, the answer is that the real world is very messy and complex. And the literature is full of interventions which seem like a good idea at the time. I myself developed a decision support system back in the 1980s. We did a field trial and it didn't help. Uh, that was about uh, diagnostic decision support for chest pain. Um, Ross Koppel, a medical sociologist, had written up a scary story uh, in JAMA, major medical journal, of, uh, of a, a, a faulty medicines management system which actually caused a lot of harm in a children's hospital in the States. Um, we did a study on MSN Messenger as an alternative interface to NHS Direct for deaf people. Again, it didn't work, it was very slow, it was inaccurate. So we do need to do these field studies. So really moving towards a conclusion, um, I think we can Im imagine a, an evaluation cascade for mHealth apps. Looking first of all at the source, then at the safety, the content, accuracy, potential for impact, so that's the intervention modelling experiment, and then finally the impact, and that does require field trials of within subject experiments, looking at uh, important measures like health behaviours and, and outcomes. So in conclusion, I think the we would all agree that the quality of M Health tools varies, but I think it, we, we have to come off the fence and say it varies too much. And we really need to do something about it. There's a whole range of techniques that we've got, user reviews, professional reviews, developer self-certification re regulation. But again, these are not enough to, to help improve the quality. And I think what we're suffering from is a bad dose of 
optimism um, and that what we need to do is to strengthen those strategies and to agree some quality criteria and then evaluate apps against those and, and label the apps with the results so that other people know. We've got people say, oh, we need some new evaluation methods. We need to do things like A-B testing. Well, that's actually what we did in our FOG study. It was a randomised online trial. We, we have these techniques. Um, we can rate the quality of evidence. We can do usability or accuracy studies. We don't need any new evaluation methods. We just need to apply the methods we've got. And this will support patients, the public, health professionals, and also app developers. I don't think app developers are bad people. They just don't know what quality means in our field. Uh, and that will maximise the benefits of, of, of M Health. So thank you very much indeed. Look forward to hearing your thoughts. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for a fantastic talk. We have time for just a couple of questions now. And as I said, at the end, we might have some more time. So we'll just take one or two questions just now. So one at the back. Sorry, 50 years ago. We're dealing with the tobacco issue 50 years yes. ago. Yes. And we had this technology available. Would we be despairing of the outcomes when we look at the data you've got um, around the apps that are supporting smoking cessation and being very mixed? So I guess that's one thought. That if, we, if 50 years ago we were looking at the tobacco issues, and we had this technology, is that where we would focus rather than the issues that we did address and continue to address? I, and I guess the question really is around obesity. Are we actually in the wrong place when we're looking for M health solutions to obesity and looking at the analogy with tobacco? Um, I mean, the, 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 the problem that I pointed out from the literature with tobacco is the content of those apps. And I think 50 years ago, it would have been a lot more difficult to program anything on a computer and people would probably have gone to talk to the right people and looked up the evidence on what works in tobacco smoking cessation. Um, and I think the first systematic <coughs> review on uh, smoking cessation was about 1992 or so. So there was evidence emerging already from trials. Um, so it, it might have uh, been a bit more focused, a bit more problem driven rather than technology driven. I think we heard about an uh, example of that earlier this morning, the risks of being too technology driven. Whereas now, because the, 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 the barrier to preparing an app is so low, people just tend to do a bit of web surfing and put something into an app which makes sense to them but may not necessarily uh, be based on evidence. Um, the question about obesity, I think that apps and M Health are an ideal way to tackle some of the uh, obesity problem. It's not the only way. And it, um, uh, was it yesterday that we saw the foresight obesity map, which is very complex indeed and includes things like uh, you know, farm subsidies and agribusiness and supermarket stra marketing strategies. And there's a whole range of, of societal issues and, and obesogenic environment issues which can't be addressed by, by uh, people's uh, apps and tools in their pocket. But they certainly will help address some of those issues. The, you know, the, the personal behaviour change issues. Another question, yes. Hi, thanks for so much for the chosen possible on Temple Street. We're running a trial at the moment for um, adolescent obesity um, management, and one thing that has been mentioned today is monitoring adverse events. Because we um, like that putting out information using YouTube, and YouTube last year changed its uh, methods. So, Receiving any piece of video information out as an advertisement. Mm. And so it means that I suppose it's just thinking about working around how to create content that we can all share and that's evidence based, but that's not duplicated constantly because it's, it's really difficult to provide evidence based content that's. Um, yes. Video -based there is a UK based charity which used to be, called, I think it's called Health Talk Online. It used to be called DIPEX, the D Database of Individual Patient Experience. Uh, but it's called Health Talk Online now. And they have focused on doing evidence based video material, which is very patient and public focused. Um, on specific conditions and even on the pros and cons of being recruited into a trial, uh, for example. So uh, Health Talk Online might be a useful repository to look at, both at what they've got there already and, and potentially 
adding your material to that. And they've done a lot of qualitative work with patient groups to try and guide the, 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 to the focus of, of the interviews and so on. So it's Sue Zebland in Oxford Department of Primary Care who leads that. So you might want to contact her. Okay, we may have some time at the end. We should probably move on to the last speaker. Thank you very much. Can we give a round of applause for